Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for our policy lecture, Giving a Voice to the Voiceless, the Role of Film and Media in Equipping Churches to Pro-Life Action. My name is Arena Grosu and I'm the Director of the Center for Human Dignity here at the Family Research Council. Today's lecture is inspired by the film Voiceless that specifically addresses the spirit of retreat that has developed within the church. Jesse Dean and his wife moved to Philadelphia so he can take a new job as an outreach leader at an old church whose membership has been declining. As everything is going well, and as he starts connecting to the community, he discovers there's an abortion facility directly across the street from the church. The film follows Jesse Dean as he makes decisions about what he's going to do about it. Joining us today are the director and producer of this powerful pro-life film, as well as Vincent DeCaro from CareNet and Dean Nelson from Human Coalition, who will also discuss practical tips for, tips for church involvement. Now I'm going to introduce our panel. Stuart Migdon is the executive producer of Voiceless. Stuart is a Christian author, a pro-life ministry leader, a pro-life speaker, and an elder in his church. Pat Neccarato is the writer, director, and producer of Voiceless. Pat has received two nominations for Voiceless at the 2015 Northeast Film Festival for Best Screenplay and Best Director. Pat is also the founder of the Christian ministry, Go Stand Speak. Vincent DeCaro is the Chief Outreach Officer of CareNet, which has made a Making Life Disciples six-part DVD curriculum that trains churches on ministering to folks in the church facing unplanned pregnancies. And Dean Nelson is the National Outreach Director at Human Coalition and Senior Fellow of African American Affairs here at the Family Research Council. Among its projects, the Human Coalition has a church toolkit that provides pastors and churches resources to address the issue of abortion with grace and compassion, clear biblical understanding, and concrete steps for the congregation. Our in-person audience has just finished screening the film, but for the benefit of all of our online viewers, we will, pl we will play the trailer now. give a warm welcome to our new community outreach leader, Jesse Dean. It says here that uh, you work at a church now. So an army ranger who's now running an outreach at a church in the city. I'm thinking of starting some boxing training. Boxing at a church. Step four. Jeff, step, step aside. Grab the wrist. Uh, uh, good job, good job. I'm referring to the clinic that's across the street. It's a family planning clinic, right? And they also have about five to 20 abortions a day. And what are we doing? I'll tell you what we're doing, nothing. Is someone addressing the situation? I just told you I'm working on it. Will I see my baby in heaven? You don't have to do this. Church has changed, Jesse. We've become more like a lamp tucked under a basket rather than a light on top of a hill. You know what something like this can do to a church? <gasps> Protesting reporters, now a death across the street. There's been death across the street for the past six months. Never question where God is leading you even if sometimes it's a bit uncomfortable. This is what God would want, Julia. Are you sure it's God leading you, or just guilt? All penance, my friend. When you have a chance to save someone's life, and they die, don't you always feel like you could have done more to help? Keep doing your boxing, Mr. Dean. At least you're swinging at Sultan. This is what you were talking about, right? Take action. Isn't it our responsibility to protect these children, regardless of the consequences? This is about being a voice for the voiceless. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy lives to come here uh, this afternoon. You know, when we, uh, when Pat and I got together and we were deciding what to do, what kind of movie we were going to make, uh, when we were talking about that, we said we wanted to make sure we communicated one very important point in our movie. And that's that uh, we wanted to motivate Christians to engage the culture. That was it. 
motivate Christians to engage the culture. And when we thought more about that, we thought, what can we make this movie about? And we came to the conclusion that the most egregious sin of our lifetime, and we believe of our lifetime, is a sin of abortion. So we made this movie to motivate the Christian to engage the culture against the sin of abortion. Now there's a line in the movie, our character, Miss Elsie, she's talking to our lead actor, Jesse, and she said, Jesse, you know, the church has become more like a lamp tucked under a basket rather than a light on top of a hill. And that really typifies, we think, uh, what's happened in, in the church here in America. And I'm going to give you a statistic to make that clear. You know, um, there was a survey done recently by Students for Life of America, and they determined that over 90% of the evangelical churches in our country do not have a pro-life presence. Think about that. Over 90% do not have a pro-life presence. And Barna did a study not too long ago, and they determined that over 90% of Christians sitting in churches want to hear the church's message about how they confront the sin of abortion. So there's something wrong there. The churches aren't talking about it, and the people want to hear about it. And you know, um, this is really not a political issue. It's a moral issue. It's a God issue. And we have a, an obligation that God is, is really seared on our hearts. Thou shalt not kill means that we are to protect life. And so we as a church have to stand up and do something about it. And you know, when we are a voice for the voiceless, it's not just our voice that speaks, it's our actions that speak, our actions in love. And so if the church were to wrap their arms around these men and women who are in these situations uh, where they have an unplanned pregnancy, and they were to help them, you know, emotionally, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, if they were to give their all to these people, then we would see a change in, in this country that we have not seen uh, even before Roe v. Wade. You see, 84% of women that have abortions, you know what they say? They say they don't feel they had a choice. They feel they don't have a choice, and the church is designed to, to, to be that voice, to give them that choice. Now, you know, it's, ex it's an exciting time that we live in right now because we have an administration here in Washington that is, uh, you know, they have a platform that's pro-life. And they want to make some changes. They want to defund Planned Parenthood. They want to make the Hyde Amendment permanent. They want to, um, they want to pass the, uh, pain, the Unborn Pain Protection Act. And they want, to they want to appoint Supreme Court justices that are pro-life. And that's a beautiful thing. But we have to be ready as a church to react. You see, um, the pro-choice movement, they're reacting, and they will react in a very, very uh, uh, aggressive way. In fact, uh, December 13th, 2016, there was an article written in the Washington Post, and the headline said, Planned Parenthood Prepares for Abortion War. That's what it says. And you know what it says they're doing? They're urging their donors to contribute more to Planned Parenthood. They are asking their supporters to go and seek care at, uh, at Planned Parenthood clinics so that they'll have a greater proportion of insured patients. Uh, they are lobbying at the local and state level uh, for political support now that they feel they can't get that at the federal level. Uh, they are telling their donors that they should stand up and be a voice against defunding Planned Parenthood. And then they're telling organizations that they should set up Planned Parenthood-like facilities all over the country. They tell their people these five things. Now, that shouldn't surprise us, but here's what really touches me. The article goes on to say that their donors are flooding in for support. The donors are flooding into Planned Parenthood for support. See, we have to have a reaction that's like that as a church. We have to be passionate in how we stand up for life. And, and, and really, what does that mean? Passion is a focus. That's what passion is. We've got to have a focus to stand up for life no matter what. So we can't be in a position where someone says, well, we're standing up for life, but what about in the case of rape and incest? No, we have to be clear and say the innocent baby does not uh, deserve to be punished for the crimes of the father. Let the father be punished. Let righteousness be held for that man.
and let us love that mother and let us make sure this child gets born. And then we can't have this attitude where we say, you know what, um, we're never going to overturn Roe v. Wade. It's never going to be uh, legal again. That's the wrong attitude. It can, be, it can be illegal overnight. We just, passion is a focus. We just move forward. Where people say, you know, can I really make a difference? Is it me that's going to make a difference? And that's why we made Voiceless. Because we want people to see that each one of us can put a stake in the ground and make a huge difference as we stand up for life. God will take care of the rest. We just have to go forward in passion like our Lord Jesus Christ did. I mean, he went with passion to the cross. He gave his life for our life eternally. And he had detractors, right? People said, his own disciples said, don't do this. What are you doing this for? And he didn't listen. He went straight ahead. And then he had people that mocked him, and he didn't listen to that, and he just did what he came to do to provide us life. And that's the kind of reaction that we have to have as Christians. Be passionate. Know that we can make a difference. And I believe that if people see our movie Voiceless, then they will leave that, uh, that experience with the desire to make a difference and then with the action that follows that to make a difference. And we can have a pro-life ministry in every church of America and make a huge difference, so much so, I believe, that it won't be about making abortion illegal. It will be about making abortion unthinkable. So thank you for coming here uh, this afternoon. God bless you all, and, and I pray that you uh, watch this movie Voiceless, and that you get engaged in the battle, and we together can do an amazing work. And have for coming, um, in case you didn't recognize him. Did anybody recognize that guy that just was up here speaking? Anybody recognize him from the movie? <laughs> he will be available for autographs. We drove, I actually drove down here from New Jersey last night, uh, spent the night, and I'm giving this presentation for one reason, and that is to warn you that if you are making a movie and you have a producer that wants to be in the movie, Run. <laughs> Don't do it, okay? You know, we had uh, two weeks of editing this film out in California, and I had to spend at least five out of those ten days of editing the film over those two weeks just in perfecting his scenes. <laughs> so, no, I always like to bust the stones. It was actually really great to get to, uh, to work with uh, the producer um, on set. Uh, but uh, my name's Pat Nicarado, writer, director of the film. And, you know, Voiceless was a, was a huge journey for me. Um, my background is uh, causing trouble out in the streets for the Lord. You know, I like to do that. Uh, as we said before, I have go, stand, speak ministry. And a lot of the things in the film were real-life experiences that I've had uh, out on the street, not necessarily people getting shot or anything like that. Close, but, you know, never really uh, pulling the trigger. But, but really having that battle, uh, and I know many of you watching this are either in church leadership, some of you here, obviously, are, 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 are pastors and uh, leaders, ministers. You know, one of the biggest battles that we had when developing this film is the same battle that I had out on the street, and I still do now, and that is to present this issue to the church in a way where, number one, it's not an extreme view where people think you're going to, you know, go out and, and pick up picket signs and do things the wrong way to offend people. And also, at the same time, not to compromise your message on what you know you have to do. Um, and abortion, obviously, is not a very easy subject to talk about, especially from the pulpit, uh, especially when you're out there in the street. You have women that are emotional, that are in a, a mental state that, yes, I believe that women are culpable for this decision, but at the same time, you can't just go up to somebody and just start hitting them over the head like Jesse Dean tried to do uh, in the film. It's got to be presented in a, in a way, in a tactical, loving way. So writing this movie was a really big challenge because we wanted to make sure that we didn't compromise in our uh, ide ideology, that we didn't compromise in saying, you know, we don't want to make it seem like, you know, we didn't want to be wishy-washy and, and, and retreat. But at the same time, we didn't want to give the pro-choice people who, you know, we re don't agree with them, uh, but we respect their decision, we respect their, their, their view, but so we didn't want to lose them as well. So I don't know if you noticed that, but the balance in doing this, 
trying to make this a character-driven movie about a real person, uh, about a person that's really having these struggles and not making it about throwing pie in the pro-choice people's face is, was one of the biggest challenges. And Stuart and I, from the beginning, uh, we had to make some really tough decisions. Uh, for one, you know, do we make this an all pro-choice, or I'm sorry, an all pro-life cast? Do we make this an all pro-life crew? And I said, you know what, Stu, we're, you know, we're doing this to inspire people to take a stand for what they believe is right. I think anybody can go out and look at this movie. I mean, I was just talking to, to a gentleman out there. I said, you know, this movie could be about standing against the GMO plant <laughs> across the street. Um, if that's what you truly believe, you could watch this film and you could say, you know what? I need to do something about this. I need to get out there and, and put, a, put a stake in the ground. So I said, let's not make this, a, a, you know, the, the typical, you know, everything's got to be super spiritual, super Christian and, and the whole entire uh, crew and, and, and everything like that. So we, when we interviewed people for the, for the jobs, we had, I don't know, 100 people on, on our crew and probably 60 actors and hundreds of extras. We had one requirement, and we said, you read the script. Can you, it, it, are you convicted to the point where you couldn't give 100% on this set by reading this movie? For, you don't have to be pro-life. But you can't be so pro-choice that you're going to become an enemy to us on set. And it was amazing how, you know, the very last scene of the film where you have the, the, uh, the church that gathers over on this side and you have the pro-choice people on that side. And, uh, and, of course, James Russo, the guy who played the pastor, I don't know if you recognize him from the Gangster 90 movies, but we had to actually tell him that he gets to kill everybody at the end of the movie to get him to do that last scene and to take this role. So he was disappointed at the end. He's like, where's my machine gun? I was like, we were just kidding, James. No, seriously, we didn't have to do that. He, was, he did a phenomenal job. But you, that last day on that, when, when we shot that scene, our production design made all the signs and they got all the pro-choice pins and... I thought it was really neat because that scene was really the pinnacle of all of our production. That scene was one of the most difficult scenes to shoot. It was one of the most difficult scenes to, uh, to congregate everybody and to really make it work and not make it look fragmented like just different groups of people were coming. We had to shut down Frankfurt Avenue in Philadelphia, which is not an easy thing to do. We needed collaboration. We needed a tight vision, and it was amazing about how we had all of these crew members, half of which were pro-choice, half of which were pro-life. It was amazing how we all worked together, but what was cool about it was that some of them would have, you would see by that scene, some of them would have pro-choice buttons on. So I was like, oh, he's pro-choice. And I thought that was really unique because this person or that woman did a really great job the whole time. And then we have this person over here who's got all the pro-life stuff on. These are crew members. And then we had some who had both. They don't know what to decide. So it was a really, really neat uh, shoot in this film in that environment because, you know, I say all that to say this. As Christians, we're, you know, we're not, I, my theology tells me that we're not supposed to separate and, dis, and, and disengage from people in society. If Jesus Christ is royally enthroned as king right now, then he's king all over everything. And then we got to put a stake in the ground in every single area of life. So maybe we weren't able to get everybody converted on set, or maybe we weren't able to gather around and pray with everybody. But right now, I think even to this day, if you ask, I don't know how many films have been shot in Philly, but we had a really cool reputation for a long time in Philadelphia as being one of the most positive, motivating, um, uh, the, one of the sets with, with the best atmospheres which was what some of the crew members were saying. And I thought that really was really cool. It went a wrong, long way. Now, I'm not trying to say we need to, you know, join hands with all the pro-choicers and sing Kumbaya and everything's going to be great. No, we have to be able to stand up. We have to confront these issues. We have to, get, we have to disagree. We can't be uh, on the middle ground. And we have to speak out. I think that's the first thing. So I hope that everybody here that watches the film, everybody here watching on the Internet, is that if you've watched Voiceless or if you know somebody that needs to take a stand, if you've watched Voiceless or you know, if you, and if you haven't watched Voiceless, you know somebody that needs to take a stand, give them this movie. Give them this movie. I don't know if you saw the movie, 
But uh, those that, I know those of you here have. But the movie's very, almost black and white. The muted colors, very gritty. It's how our hero, I believe, saw the world. But it's also, it's also that this issue is black and white. There's no neutrality here. You're either for this or you're against it. And there's no middle road. And our aim for making Voiceless was to get people, not to get them to become for it, because that, that wasn't what the movie was about. We're not trying to convince people to be pro-life by watching this movie. We're convincing people that are pro-life that it's now time to do something about it. You can't just sit on the sidelines. It doesn't mean you got to go out to a clinic and protest. It doesn't mean you got to go out and hand gospel tracts. You notice we, we tried not to do that. You have ministries here. The reason that we're up here with, with, uh, with Vince and with Dean from Human Coalition and uh, from CareNet is because these ministries give people the vehicle to take a stand. So Voiceless hopefully motivates you to do it. But now what? Well, you got two ministries I believe are going to be that are going to share with you right now. And every one of you that are pastors, every one of you that are in ministry, fathers, family, everybody, you get there's something that we all can do. There's something that we all can do. And our goal was to get Voiceless to motivate you to do that. So with that said, um, I'll turn it over to Mr. Vince. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, thanks for, for having me. Uh, I was joking with Arena earlier that but Pat and I are both Italian guys from New Jersey, and I don't know if it's safe to let two Italian guys <laughs> from New Jersey on the stage at the same event. That could be, get a little out of hand, but, uh, but we're here, and uh, hopefully we don't get into trouble. Uh, so um, it, to me, it's just amazing how God has kind of orchestrated so much of what's happened here. Uh, I've been at CareNet for almost three years, and one of the very first meetings I did uh, when, I, when I joined CareNet was to actually meet with Stuart. Uh, so we've been, we've been talking to each other for many years, and it's just amazing to see um, how God kind of orchestrated what they were doing with this film and what CareNet was doing with the, uh, the Making Life Disciples curriculum. Um, and it's come to the point now where two and a half, three years later, it's kind of hard to start separating out, you know, what came first, uh, so to speak, because we were really kind of moving along parallel tracks, trying to accomplish a similar thing in a lot of ways. Um, and the way we've really tried to frame this, as, as Pat actually just pointed out, is voiceless is the inspiration, right? But what's the, what's the implementation, right? So that movie, every time I see it, inspires me. It's just a great movie. It's very inspirational. But again, you know, all right, now what do we do? You know, you're ready to act, okay? And so, again, at this, while these great guys were producing this great film, we at CareNet were kind of thinking through all of that. And we spent about two years developing the program that I'm going to talk to you, uh, talk to you about today. I have a couple of data points that, that I want to share um, that I think sort of enhance what the film kind of brings out in a sort of a dramatic way, uh, but puts a little bit of more, I guess, meat and some numbers behind that. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we did a study of, uh, of women in the United States who have had an abortion and their views on church. We, we uh, partnered with Life, LifeWay Research. Uh, this was a nationally representative sample of women who have, who have had abortions. So age, race, demographics, income, religion, et cetera, et cetera, nationally representative. Uh, the only thing that they all had in common was that they had at least one abortion in their lifetime. And we found some very, very interesting things, again, that were just sort of in line with the sorts of things that Pat and Stuart were discovering as they were making this film. Um, so one of those things was that nearly four in ten women were attending a Christian church once a month or more at the time of their first abortion. So that's basically across all Christian, Christian denominations, Catholic, Protestant, etc. Four out of ten women were attending, a, were attending at least once per month at the time of their first abortion. So if you kind of look at the, the percentages there, the first three columns starting from the left add up to about 37, 36, 37 percent. Um, so if you kind of take out all the folks that maybe go to church occasionally or never, you're still left with nearly four out of every ten women, which is, and, and again, this was very consistent across denominations, um, Catholic, Protestant, et cetera. We found very similar numbers um, across the board there. So just kind of let that number sit with you for a moment. Um, Guttmacher, 
has done several studies about the religious affiliation or uh, identity of folks who have had who have had abortions. I think their latest number is about 54 percent of women who have had abortions identify as Christian. So, you know, this number is probably a little bit more conservative in it's in that it's not just that you identify as being Christian, but that you're actually regularly attending uh, religious services. So, um, so we're fairly confident in saying that you know this is a a log in our eye sort of issue in the church that we really need to confront. Next, um, I promise this is the last data slide. I won't bore you with any more boring, boring data because I'm much more interesting in the data than the data. Um, uh, as women considered their abortion decision, the most typical reactions slash expectations were judgmental or condemning. Again, across denominations, um, you had judgmental and condemning. You can kind of see them in the middle there were the most common reactions that women expected from their churches when they found out that they were pregnant. And then even frankly, the 36%, I did not re receive any reaction nor had any expectations. So that's not good either. <laughs> so it's, it's Sunday morning, you wake up, you take a pregnancy test, there's a plus sign there, and you're about to go to church, and your feeling is that my church is going to have absolutely no perspective whatsoever on the fact that I'm, pre I'm pregnant right now, and I'm nervous, and I'm scared, and I don't know what to do. That's bad too. So whether it's a negative reaction or no reaction at all, those are, those, are, those are problems. So with all that in mind, oh, there's one more. I lied. Okay. Um, so if you just look at the very bottom line there, local churches had no influence on my decision about whether or not to keep my baby. So about three in four women indicate that their local church had no influence on their decision to terminate their pregnancy. So kind of more of the same in terms of what the last sli slide said. And you can even see that in, in some cases um, they you know encouraged me to have the the procedure uh, referred me to an abortion provider, um, drove me to the pregnancy termination or abortion. So these are fairly discouraging things that we're hearing about. Wh again, what's happening in our church among people who regularly attend church in this case. So fairly, fairly discouraging. However, wherever Christ is, there's hope, right? Um, and so we did this research, um, and then we worked, again, at, at least for a year um, in developing a program that will allow people to take the inspiration that they get from a film like Voiceless or from looking at this data or from reading about something or hearing about what Planned Parenthood is doing um, and say, okay, now what do I do? We wanted to provi provide the, this is what you can do now. This is an option that you have available to you, what you can do. And as many of you might know, CareNet is an organization that primarily supports a network of, of pregnancy centers around the country. So we've been doing that since the early 80s, actually. We were founded in, in the 70s, but in the 80s we started uh, running, uh, you know, supporting a network of pregnancy centers. Um, so we've been doing that for decades. So we basically took an aspect of pregnancy center ministry, um, very specifically, how do you, as a, as a person who cares, get the skills and the knowledge and the what you need, the, the nuance that you need in order to help somebody, to walk somebody, whether it's a woman or a man, through a pregnancy decision that they have to make. Because it's not just women that make pregnancy decisions. The guy who got her pregnant, he's also making a decision and is often the most influential uh, party for good or for ill in that decision that she's making. So we've designed a curriculum that helps people in the church learn how to walk alongside women and men who are facing a pregnancy decision. So it's, it's taking that aspect of pregnancy center ministry and training the church on how to do that. Um, it's, I brought a sample, it's real, I'm not just making it up, this is, this is the actual curriculum. There's a leader's guide, there's DVDs, um, the, uh, so it's DVD-based training, video-based training, um, just really absolutely fantastic stuff. Um, and I think, um, you know, what this really does is, you know, address uh, something that that um, that uh, Pat, uh, Pat, both Pat and Stewart brought up earlier, which is this notion of, you know, is abortion a political issue? Um, well, I, I mean, I guess anything's a political issue, right? Hunger is a political issue. Poverty is a political issue. You name it, right? But churches typically do things to address poverty and hunger and all these other things, right? And so, and... And if you kind of ask yourself, well, well, why do churches feed the poor, clothe the naked, et cetera, et cetera? Well, because it's, it's, a, it's a, a ministry heart, right? Does, churches have a ministry heart to reach out to people and serve them in these capacities. Um, so from our standpoint, 
whether whether it's a political issue or not, we're saying don't worry about whether or not it's a political issue. This is a ministry issue, right? So you don't have to vote for anything. You, you frankly don't even have to preach about anything. You have to vote. You don't have to march. You don't have to do any of those things. You could do those things if you want to, but you don't have to. All you have to do is have a ministry in your church that lovingly reaches out to people who are facing pregnancy decisions. And what we're finding, uh, as we talk to pastors and priests and church leaders, is that if you frame this as a ministry issue, just like you would frame drug addiction, porn addiction, hunger, divorce, grief, all these other programs that churches have ministries for, and this is just compassion for the pregnant, right? So clothing for the hungry, compassion for the pregnant, you know, food for the hungry, clothes for the, I, I messed that up. You, you get the point. Uh, <laughs> food for the naked, I don't know. Um, and so <laughs> whatever, you, whatever, you know, whatever floats your boat. And so um, this is compassion for the, for the pregnant. It, it's a ministry response. Um, it gives churches that opportunity to create a ministry on-ramp for women and men in their church, again, in their church, log in our eye, right, um, who are facing these, these difficult pregnancy decisions and teaches churches how to walk alongside those, those folks um, and give them the support that they need. Um, so I'm going to sit down now, but one last thing I want to, I meant, want, what I want to mention is we're very eager to get this out into as many places as possible. It was expensive to, to produce, so we have to charge people for it, but we want to give people a 20% discount um, on buying that from our store. So if you go to store dot care-net.org, you can use the code FRC20 uh, to actually get 20% off. It's about $135 for the Leaders Kit, which has the Leaders Guide, the DVDs, and some additional resources that you can uh, have available for the men and women that you're serving. Uh, so FRC20, all one word, gives you a 20% discount on that. And so we wanted to offer that to anyone who's watching online, anyone who's here in person, anyone who sees this, frankly, uh, to be able to use, uh, to use that code to, to get their hands on the curriculum. So thank you. Thanks, Vince. Thank you, Arena, FRC family, for the opportunity to be here, and to uh, my good friend Stuart, who we have uh, worked together for the last, uh, I guess, year or so on a fine film. Uh, as was stated, I serve as the uh, National Outreach Director for Human Coalition and also serve here as a senior fellow at the Family Research Council. I want to bring to your attention in Proverbs chapter 24 and verse 12, it says this, it says that, uh, rescue those who are being led away to death. Hold back those who stagger towards the slaughter. And if you say we knew nothing about this, does not he who guards your life not know it? Does not he who saves your life not perceive it? Will he not repay everyone for what he has done? At Human Coalition, we take very seriously the charge from our Lord to be involved in what we believe is the most important uh, issue of our day, and that is uh, rescuing uh, those who are the most vulnerable. Yesterday in the city of Pittsburgh, about 40 pastors gathered together uh, to pray and to strategize about the issue of McGee Hospital, which in one particular part of that hospital delivers babies, but at the other end of that hospital, they actually perform abortions. Also yesterday evening, a African-American pastor who's just planting a church hosted not far from here on the campus of George Mason University, a screening of a wonderful film, not this film, but uh, a film called Ma'afa 21, which talks about uh, black genocide with, uh, and connecting it to abortion. Also in the city of Raleigh, North Carolina, Bishop Patrick Wooden, who is a great friend of ours, pastors a 2,000-member uh, church in Raleigh, North Carolina. He actually has a group from his church that goes out uh, every week, and they pray in front of an abortion clinic. In addition, he has a pregnancy center that is actually in part of his church property. I also will mention that in the city of Pittsburgh, going into the elections, a African-American pastor who serves as part of our coalition uh, director there in the city of Pittsburgh was so moved by this issue that he actually uh, distributed over 200,000 pro-life voter guides throughout his community, helping to get the word out about how important this issue was and how people needed to better match their votes with their values. 
In Tarrant County, Texas, there is a megachurch pastor who has stated that he wants to make abortion unthinkable and to create Tarrant County to be a county that is an abortion-free zone. And he's committed to giving tens of thousands of dollars to help make that a reality. My point is, is that throughout our country, there are pastors who have joined with the human coalition that believe that we can make abortion unthinkable in our society. I'm most proud to acknowledge that in the city of Memphis, Tennessee, which is the home of the largest African-American denomination in our country, the Church of God in Christ, have boldly announced a three-year partnership with Human Coalition to make abortion unthinkable, particularly in urban communities around our nation. I want to submit to you that the church is coming alive through the work of good people like Human Coalition for the many of the pro-life organizations that are working throughout the country, and through innovation and technology. We see through this film, uh, Voiceless, that has brought to the big screen uh, a dramatic presentation about the issue of abortion within our community. One of the things that we have done at Human Coalition over the last several years is we have now conducted uh, thousands of surveys in key cities that we serve with our pregnancy uh, clinics um, of pastors that have completed surveys in the cities of Dallas, Texas, in Atlanta, Georgia, in uh, Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Thousands of surveys asking what the church is actually doing. And through these thousands of surveys, we have actually created a church engagement index so that we can tell in every city that we surveyed what the church is doing and how we can come alongside the church to increase their commitment, whether that is giving uh, to pro-life organizations, whether that is being involved in activism or helping to support candidates that are pro-life, or whether that is doing training to help educate pastors and leaders on how they can communicate uh, this difficult issue to their congregations. The information that Vince pointed out a little bit earlier highlights the fact that many of those who are getting abortions within our community have some connection to the church. We want to invite you to visit our website at humancoalition.org where you can connect with our church engagement team. There is a resource uh, toolkit that we provide so that pastors can better understand, and this is free of charge. They can actually learn how to communicate this issue. They can also learn how to be more engaged within their community. One of the things that we have done and are continuing to develop is a, uh, a prayer app where every person can actually log on and pray real time for women who are facing abortion. Human Coalition is committed to serving the 1.4 million women uh, every year in our nation that are facing this difficult decision of choosing an abortion. And we believe that the church is the real institution that can come alongside in a variety of ways to engage the community, to serve families, and hopefully to see women choose life for their unborn child and choose Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior so that they don't have to fall into this difficult decision once again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you to our panel. Uh, what we'll do now is I'm going to ask the panel members a couple of questions and then we're going to, once they give their answers, we're going to open it up for questions from you in the audience. So my first question is, what would you tell pastors who are uncomfortable bringing up abortion in their churches? You want to start? Sure. Um, I would tell them that your congregation wants to hear the message. Uh, they, they've uh, resoundingly uh, spoke and said they want to hear it. Uh, it's sensitive and it's difficult because, as Vince said, many of the women in the pews in churches have had abortions. Many of the men have been involved in that. And so anytime I speak at a church in regard to uh, the subject matter of abortion, I start off by letting women know, and men know that have been involved in this, that they can be forgiven and set free by taking their sin to the cross. 
and Christ will forgive them and set them free from it, and then they can be incredible uh, influencers in this whole pro-life battle. And so um, I would say do that. Let the women know with compassion, but give your congregation what they want. God has put that within them to do so. Yeah, well, they have to watch Voiceless. <laughs> of course. Next? No. Yeah. Um, you know, they have to have boldness. Uh, it's not easy being a pastor of a church. Um, I mean, uh, it's not something that is uh, – not going to, you're not going to keep everybody happy. Uh, but at the other side, a pastor has a, a, a responsibility to shepherd the whole flock. So uh, preaching the Word of God will, will help, but you're going to have to take a step out in faith, and you're going to have to have boldness, and you're going to have to take a stand and take a position on this. Um, don't be afraid to lose people in your congregation. Don't be afraid to have difficult conversations. And always remember that what we're dealing with here is human life. This isn't just, um, you know, some sort of abstract issue that we should sort of, and we kind of get so desensitized with abortion that it just, you know, we can just walk by a clinic and go, oh, wow, there's an abortion clinic, and not realize what's truly happening inside a real human life is being absolutely massacred. And if you think about that as a pastor, uh, it's going to really have to come down to, are you willing to, to really take a stand for those children? And, of course, obey, obey the Word of God. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'll just, you know, just kind of reiterate uh, something that I mentioned earlier, which is uh, sort of this you know, difference between ministry and advocacy, right? Um, and I think one of the ways, again, that we're finding as we see churches, there's a few hundred churches now that are starting to use uh, the, the program. As we're speaking to those folks, the thing that we're finding is that um, their, their ability to sort of frame this as a ministry issue um, allows them to kind of sidestep in a way. It gives them the out, so to speak, for a lot of those political issues that they might not want to want to touch. Um, and so, you know, just creating that ministry on-ramp in a church to provide compassion for folks who are facing a difficult situation, um, just helping pastors and priests and church leaders, you know, just reframe, just kind of have that light bulb sort of go off in their head um, and, and remind them, so to speak, that this is how you handle all of these other, you know, issues uh, in your church, and this should be this should be no different. Yeah, one of the things I um, talk often about is this idea of righteousness and justice, um, and we have tried to communicate to pastors from a, from a biblical perspective that um, this is uh, just as much of a justice issue for those uh, as that scripture in Proverbs spoke about, talking about those who need, need to be rescued. I mean, we really honestly look uh, what this abortion really is doing. It is not just the taking of an innocent human life, but the reality is that it, it's harming women. I mean, whether it is physically or psychologically, and so we're encouraging pastors to uh, think about this from a standpoint of how you can serve the women that are in your your churches. We know that um, probably if you go to you know any church, there's probably a, a 20, 30 percent or maybe higher of the women who have participated in abortion. And I think that there's a way to communicate uh, with, uh, with grace uh, and to even establish uh, within your churches um, ministries to provide counseling uh, and help and healing to women who have been impacted by this issue. So uh, similar to what Vince has stated, I believe that we do want to message this within our congregations um, with grace uh, because we are dealing with uh, real ministry. But at the same time, I think that we cannot shrink back from our commitment to standing up uh, as a prophetic voice within our generation for uh, the most vulnerable. And I'd like to uh, follow up on that as well, because I really like the idea of, of looking at this as a ministry, as, as both Vince and uh, Dean have said, there are so many women in the church who've already had abortions and they don't feel like they can talk about it. Um, so we need a ministry for post-abortive women and men uh, because they're mothers and fathers just without their children present, uh, as well as women who are in, in, in a situation where, they, where they're feeling like they can't come to the church to talk about the fact that they're pregnant. Um, but also, I think another way is if we want these women and men to choose life for their children, 
these chur our churches need to become communities of support once they choose life. And so do we have uh, daycare? Do we have a welcoming ministry for families? And I think that that's, that's looking at the longer picture of the ministry so that it comes full circle, that we provide ministries for, for women and men before they, maybe we should have abstinence ministries so that they don't, they don't go the direction of ending up in an unplanned pregnancy all the way to having a, a supportive community once they choose life and have a family. Uh, my second question for for the panel is, okay, so what if one of the members of a parish is very pro-life, very on fire, but they're not getting anywhere with the pastor? What can a Christian in a parish do who is not heard by the pastor? You know, they should continue to pray, for sure, uh, for their pastor to understand what it is they want to accomplish, and then take that don't quit attitude. So if the pastor doesn't want to listen to what they have to say uh, specifically, then find a place where they will listen relative to starting a pro-life ministry. You know, when we started the pro-life ministry in our church, we just got a group of people together and we said, what is it about the pro-life movement that you're passionate about? What is it that the Lord can gift you in doing? And then some people said, you know, all I really feel comfortable in doing is, is knitting some baby blankets, you know, for, for, for uh, women who choose life. And I said, okay, that's cool. Let's do that. And somebody else said, let's do a baby shower uh, ministry. So we'll throw baby showers for women who have issues like that. And some said, I want to go out in front of the, the abortion clinic, and I want to counsel with women and talk with them. And, and some want to get involved in the political end of, of the equation, and, and, and a post-abort of counseling ministry grew out of that and so many more so we've got 10 different things that we do at this church just because we got together and we said how can we make this happen uh, and use the gifts that God has given us so I would say to that person don't quit pray about it and start somewhere and find common ground with the pastor yeah I think in majority of churches in America are only around 75 to 100 people so that is the situation right now. You probably have one or two people in each church that maybe have a passion that want to do something. If that's you, don't try to go in and change the world uh, with your pastor overnight. It's not going to work. Um, what I would do is go sit down with your pastor and ask him to pray and to just have a covering for whatever work it is that you want to do. And that could be, you know, I'm assuming you're thinking, well, this person wants to maybe even go to the clinic, which is, is really kind of a scares pastors, like what is this going to turn into? Um, and then you have the other side of it where maybe you just want to support your local pregnancy center or you want to support a, a, an online ministry or whatever the case may be. Bring it up to your pastor, start with baby steps, get that prayerful, prayerful covering, and then watch and see what happens. Now, obviously, if your pastor is completely against uh, pro-life ministry, then you have to ask yourself, you know, where's the doctrine? What's going on here? And you may have to make a decision to move on. But I don't think there's a pro-life pastor, even if they're completely against activism, that wouldn't say, yeah, you want to be, do this. We'll, we'll definitely pray for you. We'll keep you accountable. We'll uh, give you maybe an opportunity at some point to bring this out to the church uh, and to share what you're doing and then hopefully get a couple of other people involved. You know, I think there's actually an important word that we, we haven't mentioned yet, and I, it's my fault because I was supposed to say it, but what it actually says on, on the, uh, the tagline, so to speak, yeah, the D word, equipping the church to offer compassion, hope, help, and discipleship to women and men considering abortion. So that discipleship, that concept of discipleship is an extremely important one. Um, and I would venture to guess that most church leaders didn't get into ministry um, for kind of a social services sort of thing. They got into ministry to help people become disciples of Jesus Christ, right? And so if you're in a church and you go up to the, uh, the, your pastor or your priest or whatever and say, I want to do X, Y, and Z, we need to raise this much money, we need to do all this, kind of like a social services sort of pitch, it might fall on deaf ears. But if you go to your pastor and say, there are women and men in our community who are facing unplanned pregnancies or in our church who need to become disciples of Jesus Christ, and we can help them do that. How many, how many pastors are going to say, now, nah, yeah, that, that, that's somebody else's job. <laughs> you, you can't, churches can't outsource discipleship, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's what churches should do, right? And so, again, we've kind of framed this around. This is, this is um, and Arena uh, made a great point, too, just in terms of, because um, obviously discipleship is a long-term process, right? So now the baby's born. 
and hopefully you got the, the dad involved in some way, shape, or form as well. Now you're trying to build a family, right? You're not just saving a baby, you're building a, you're building a family. Um, and so these are the sorts of things that churches are equipped to do, right? They have children's ministries, men's ministries, marriage ministries, all these other ministries to not only save the life of that child, but to also disciple them uh, uh, and, you know, for the long term and help them, you know, build a strong family, become disciples of Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the sorts of things that churches, frankly, are already doing. And Making Life Disciples is a sort of program that can build the bridge, so to speak, between the unplanned pregnancy and all these other services that churches offer um, around, you know, helping families thrive, right? So we just need that, that, that bridge. At Human Coalition, we love volunteers, um, and what we do is we, you know, obviously we serve at the crisis. When a woman actually comes, uh, she's wanting to get an abortion, but she's trying to figure out her, her options. But we also have what we call pre-crisis and post-crisis. And so uh, on the pre-crisis side, you know, so in the city of Pittsburgh, we serve, you know, about 10,000, you know, students a year through abstinence programs. On the post crisis, we have what we call our continuum of care program, where we do everything uh, from helping to find that woman um, housing, uh, job placement, um, any type of social services that, that she might need. But the goal, even beyond that, is to get her plugged into a, uh, a church where she can get, as Vince spoke about, the discipleship. And so we actually have uh, developed a way for volunteers to become, to get involved with that process. So we'll have uh, volunteers that'll host a, a baby shower for that, that woman um, so that she now has a community or a, or a family where uh, she feels accepted and, and loved. And this is the church being very relevant. Uh, when you host a baby shower, give love and acceptance, right? A, a woman who maybe she was, uh, it was an unplanned pregnancy, maybe she, uh, she was not married. And so now she actually has community. And our hope is, is to take her uh, with a loving uh, community and lead her to ultimately discipleship. And so those are some ways that we encourage people within uh, our local uh, women's clinics to, uh, to get involved. And I also think uh, at what Dean is saying about having a baby shower or some kind of event like that, even when a church holds one, word gets around to other women. And so those numbers that Vince shared before, that women who find themselves in unplanned pregnancies uh, find the church judgmental or that they're closed off, once they know that there's some kind of ministry for them and that someone will welcome them and their baby, that changes everything. So that's what we want to create, a, a, a church that is welcoming to women who find themselves in that situation. So right now we'd like to open it up for your questions. You can direct them to any of our panelists and uh, we'll come around with the microphone. Hi. Uh, the question is that the median age is 24 and half the women that come today for an abortion have already had an abortion and have already had a child. So we're really dealing with uh, people who have already had children. Uh, what is the outreach there? It's, from what I understand, the typical person thinks that someone is a teenager, but in fact that 7% are under 18. So what are we doing on the other end of it for the people who really do already know it's a baby, who've already got a baby, and that's part of the problem that they've got too many babies in their mind, you know? Where's that? Let me just say quickly, I'm sure others have, have a comment. We've got to show that woman that she has a choice. That woman believes that there's no choice. Finances are difficult. The husband's left the house. Maybe uh, she doesn't, she's not even married. Um, and, and so there are some emotional issues perhaps going on, et cetera. All of those things can be handled within the confines of, of the local church and even beyond her attending that church, uh, but, uh, but as an outreach to the community around them. Good question. And obviously, you know that, that profile. I mean, we found that that's exactly uh, the people that are actually contacting us uh, at Human Coalition through um, our aggressive advertising. And what our, our goal is, is to be able to still communicate to that woman all of the full range of options. Because we still find after, you know, we have over 70,000 recorded calls of women who are planning to get an abortion, but they call us. And we still find, that, though, that a large number of those women, they, they still don't want to really 
take the life of their unborn child. They're looking at all of the circumstances and the challenge. And so that's why we offer everything from, you know, a gift card, you know, to uh, have her to come, you know, and visit that offsets the cost for her gas to uh, testing other ideas uh, that we can help to um, remove the obstacles that she feels. And, uh, and I be believe that that's why we're having uh, such great results at seeing this hard case. Uh, this woman that, you know, typically is not going to go to your average pregnancy center, she is headed to get an abortion. But she decides to make that particularly because of the, the counseling uh, that she's getting from uh, the people that she speaks to on the phone, as well as answering some of the ob other objections, whether it's the housing, whether it's the financial need. Those are things that we realize that, uh, that are making women choose this decision that otherwise they may not want to. And the, the only thing I'll add to that, I, Larry, I think you're absolutely right. I think we shouldn't assume that people, just because they go to church and are even if they're, they go to church and are pro-life, that they necessarily know all this, these facts and data that all of us sort of take for granted. Um, so one of the, you know, one of the important things that I think Making Life Disciples at least is attempting to do um, is to sort of raise the, the pro-life IQ of the people in the church so that they're more aware of the, you know, the history of abortion, how Roe versus Wade got, uh, got passed, you know, what the data is, you know, et cetera, et cetera, so that they're more aware of situations like that so they can you know, kind of attune their ears and their eyes to kind of see what's going on around them and maybe be able to, uh, you know, pick out those sorts of situations that need, need to be addressed that might not fit, you know, the stereotype, so to speak, of what they think they're supposed to see when, when an unplanned pregnancy happens. Father Imbarato, Priest for Life. Um, and thank you, Dean. I've been in conversation with the crew down in Texas and I'm traveling down there next month, supposedly, to, to talk about uh, Catholic outreach, right? How can we connect with the Catholic churches? And you being here today reminded me that I dropped the ball on that. So, <laughs> Pat, I, I, I saw, today was the second time I saw Voiceless. I saw it in July. Divinely inspired. Thank you for cooperating with the Holy Spirit, really. I mean, it is so layered. It's so deep. So much breath. And so many parts of the movie, I mean, just as we use the Bible for Bible study, we could use voiceless to do study on the breadth and depth of pro-life activism. And so I just want to make two points and ask you to comment on it, all right? And Dean, again, you brought up, I think, the first very important point, that when pastors, Catholic, Protestant, evangelical, want to preach on abortion. They need to understand, and the movie showed it, right? When Rusty gets up there the first time to talk about it, the immediate reaction of the people, why? Because they're post-abortive. They're post-abortive. We need to recognize the people in the pews, all right? And I think, Vincent, you said 20 to 30 percent ripple effect, directly or indirectly, a lot deeper than that. Pastors need to preach to the woundedness first, Preach to the wounded, preach about mercy, then we can talk about the children that are dying. So that's the first point that I'd like you to comment on. The second point I think that is very, very important, the movie brings it out again, and it becomes the biggest obstacle, I think, to discipleship activism. And the, the, the symbolism in the movie, the abortion mill is across the street. Church on one side, the abortion mill, the scene of the crime, the scene of the death, is across the street. And even at the end, right, we never see them get to the other side of the sidewalk, right? The fear, the fear of going to where these abortions are happening and seeing it for themselves is, and Arena, you used the word retreat, right? Retreat. We get into abortion or, or pro-life activism, but yet... All right, we, we stop at a certain point. And I think it's so, so important that as Rusty went across the street, right, as the church was moving across the street, we need to encourage congregations to spend time at the foot of Calvary. These modern-day Calvaries with the most innocent blood of our culture is being shed. I 
my four grandkids I know are pro-life. They're pro-life because at early ages, I brought them to Metropolitan Medical Associates, and Rena knows what I'm talking about, all right, to see exactly what's going on. These poor women going in and seeing where these babies die. And I think that if every pro-lifer in this country spent one hour a week in front of an abortion mill, not only would the witness cause the industry to implode, but you'd have a new level of activism, right? Because that would be where the grace starts and where the grace flows from. So I think the movie tells it all, and I think we need to translate that now into the programs that we're going to use to activate our churches. So you can comment as you would like. <clears throat> the preach to the woundedness first. I like that. I might use that. Oh. <laughs> I do think that with technology, um, like this great film is a great way to uh, to engage uh, even you know pastors who who say that they know, but they they need to uh, they really need to know more. One of the things that we found at Human Coalition, where we have a a treasure trove of small short videos to help engage people uh, and even pastors to understand and to message better on this issue. But uh, again, if you visit the website uh, humancoalition.org, there's a, in the resource portion probably about, I don't know, at least maybe uh, 20 different videos that are short videos um, to kind of get people engaged. Uh, in helping them to understand how to speak about this issue uh, in a winsome way um, if pastors are a little bit, um, you know, concerned about uh, speaking to their congregations that may be post-abortive. But it's a great way to at least begin that conversation. Let's give another round of applause to our fabulous panelists. Thank you all for coming to the screening and to the policy lecture and for our viewers online as well. If you haven't seen Voiceless, I encourage you to pre-order the DVD that comes out March 6th by going to voicelessthemovie.com. I also encourage you to go to Human Coalition and CareNet to look at their church kits and to uh, equip your church with the tools necessary so that you can actually start a pro-life ministry or to increase it if you already have one going on. Uh, please join us for future policy lectures by visiting frc.org events. Thanks so much for being here. Have a great day.